Welcome back. This is CS50 and the start of week eight. So, this animation you saw a moment ago is actually not a movie. It's actually a web page. And this web page is implemented entirely in a language called JavaScript. And that language called JavaScript supports now, or increasingly, a、uh, technology called WebGL, a graphics library with which you can actually implement fancy things like this. Just to either in,、uh, tease or scare, if we actually look at the source code for the page that you just saw playing some music and sound, this is an example of a language called JavaScript that we'll dive into next week. Syntactically, it's actually quite similar to C, but you'll see that this person put a good deal of work into this particular animation. So it did take some degree of effort. Anyhow, today is ultimately about、uh, pulling back the layers of the internet and the web and transitioning us from C, much to your pleasure perhaps, and transitioning us to、uh, PHP and HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and SQL, ingredients with which we will dive into the web programming portion of the course and a lot of the more familiar technologies that we take perhaps a, on a daily basis for granted. So, know that in just a week or two's time, you will be able to put together yourself websites like this,、uh, which I found in the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine this morning. If you go back 10 or so years,、um, I lost、uh, quite miserably.、Um, but I thought I would take a screenshot of this because this is also a wonderful example of how not to make a website.、Um, besides. Um, it's, it's clear what the website was for, perhaps, but these silly little icons where I thought it would be cool to have this guy in a hood saying, come in, enter, click to enter. Click to enter is not a cool feature of a website.、Right? You've probably seen this on many websites, particularly those implemented fairly animatedly with a technology called Flash. And,、uh, well, this was me learning how to、uh, program in,、uh, for the web way back then. It didn't get much better.、Um, then,、uh, fast forward to senior year, and this is apparently what my website looked like because I had a Muppets calendar that I apparently thought was cool at the time. So I scanned this in and then had my own server running an operating system called Linux, although an older version than what we're using today. And then I put my professional portfolio of web work and such up here on this website. So、uh, I think that's the worst of it. Though I'm thinking, I actually have all the campaign materials, including the posters and the platform. So I'm thinking of running again this year if that is allowed.、Um, so we shall see.、Um, so the internet is something we certainly take for granted. I thought we'd take a quick look, though, with a teaser. It's about 50 or so seconds long as to how the internet works. And then we'll start, as promised, to peel back these layers today and moving forward this week. I give you Warriors of the Net. He came with a message, with a protocol all his own. Firewalls, uncaring routers, and dangers far worse than death. He's fast, he's strong, he's TCPIP, and he's got your address. Warriors of the Net. So that is how the internet works, and. <laughs> Um, we will dive into more details、uh, over the course of today and this week. So, a couple of quick announcements. So, one, you probably found this and 36 other photos, and now it's time to actually find these staff on campus and photograph yourself or someone with your,、uh, from your section with them.、Uh, the deadline for this scavenger hunt to get us as many photographs of you, and they in the, of you and them in them is Monday at noon, just before next week's lecture. So, feel free to partake in the winning section. We'll get some fabulous prize.、Um, the big board. So, this is the carrot. That's historically been associated with problem set six. Realize first, this is completely optional.、Uh, it's for those who actually want to participate in a competition of sorts with your code. 
、um, fairly publicly. So if you go to the course's homepage as of today, you will see that atop the list are frankly a whole bunch of staff who took the course last year.、Um, this is not to say that most of you are、uh, behind now, but rather this is、uh, mostly staff, though, some of your own classmates who have challenged the so called big board. So problem set six, recall, involves implementing the fastest spell checker possible, and you need to deploy tools like hash tables or tries or linked lists or some other fancy data structures. And once you get your code working, you can run a command called check 50 inside of the appliance, which will upload your code to one of our servers. It will run And be benchmarked. To benchmark something means to analyze it in terms of its memory use and its、uh, CPU time. And so, what you have here are the top 20 people who, since about 4 a.m. last night, have challenged the big board.、Um, I think, my apologies, Nathan's about to get disqualified because the staff and I are all quite suspicious that this is not, in fact, a legitimate entry. 0.150 seconds. Is an order of magnitude faster than the、uh, next most、uh, rapid one, Neil.、Um, so either Nathaniel is about to be promoted to staff,、um, or we're going to delete his entry there. So there are ways to、um, cheat at this competition, but. Uh, we, will, we are good at detecting such. So, what are you seeing here on the left hand column? You see how much RAM each of these folks'、uh, programs、uh, used. In my defense, I was actually number one last night around 4 a.m.,、um, but I have slipped since then、um, using 38 megabytes of RAM. And then if you scroll to the right, you'll see in each column how many seconds were spent in the load function, the check function, size, unload, and so forth. And if you read the fine print, you'll see exactly how we are benchmarking your code. So, if you'd like to do that, Any time before the deadline, by all means, feel free to partake. But certainly don't feel that any bubbles have been burst if you don't quite get to the point of challenging that. It is just for fun.、Uh, so, the final project, the spec will be posted later today on the course's website as a PDF.、Uh, it will be very much as predicted in week zero of the course, where this will be an opportunity in a few weeks' time for you to implement most anything you want, working either solo or in groups of two or three with classmates.、Um, I will say that historically, about 80 plus percent. Of the class tackles web based projects. So even though、uh, maybe 80% of the class has no idea how to make web based projects at this point in time, that is a、uh That is a lack of feature we shall fix this week, next week, and beyond. So know that as you start to think about your final project, we have a tradition of seminars where the TFs and CAs and staff from across campus offer a slate of one time classes that are totally optional that give you. Opportunities to learn stuff、uh, related to, but not core to the course. So, this year already, we have a、uh, running roster of seminars that will be scheduled, filmed, and presented over the next month、um, on Java, on educational software using Emacs, iOS, jQuery, Ruby on Rails, a whole bunch of terms with which you might not be familiar, and that's fine. Just scroll on down and you'll read descriptions of these. And they're meant to be really inspiration or tools to bootstrap you toward making projects that might use technologies and languages. That we might not otherwise cover in the course. And if you're a little eager to get,、uh, get going, realize that we have three prior year, four prior years worth of seminars, all videotaped, all with slides, some with code there. So it's quite the treasure chest of stuff that you can learn on your own. And also, what we've done. Is put together this site, projects.cs50.net,、um, which is meant to be a repository for ideas from the staff and people across campus, faculty and full time staff alike.、Um, I get an email like every other day from folks across campus saying, Hi, do you know some student who might want to、uh, help us make this particular,、uh, solve this particular problem? So, what you'll see here is recent postings from students and staff and faculty with ideas that they are hoping to either work with you on toward the end of the semester and maybe into J term and Beyond,、um, or to have you implement and save the day for them. So,、uh, you will be asked in just a couple weeks' time to pre propose a project, which will be an opportunity with a very short form to just tell your TF what you're thinking about so that he or she can kind of gauge as to the viability of it, given the time allowed, and just how complex or how simple it might be. Then you'll have a formal proposal, and once we A OK your proposal, you are free to dive into your project. But more on that later today on the PDF. On the course's website. And lastly, those of you who are either eager、uh, this coming year 
or uh, this coming summer,、um, or even beyond in pursuing tech internships. Generally, there are plenty of companies that will hire someone after taking CS50, or particularly after taking CS50 and something else in the spring. So, generally, having two solid CS courses under your belt is enough to get you into the door of a lot of popular tech companies Google, Microsoft, and the like.、Um, what our own、uh, Matt and Melissa are going to be holding this Friday is really a crash course on how to prepare for these kinds of interviews in tech.、Um, Or even if you're a freshman and not really thinking about this yet, but you kind of want to know what this world might be like.、Um, historically, OCS tends to cater a little less toward the technology company, so we thought we'd try to bring this in house and do our best to equip you with some fun puzzles and to give you a sense of what does it mean to have a technical interview about programming and computer science. I will say, from personal experience, when being interviewed by Microsoft、uh, on campus and the、uh, recruiter says, Oh, so what's your favorite language? Do not try to show off and say,、mm, I really like assembly language. Because if my own experience is any indication, that recruiter will then proceed to ask you a question about one of the most difficult languages in which to program.、Um, and you have to then prove to him or her that you actually know what you're talking about. So, suffice it to say,、I'm, no one told me this 10 years ago、uh, when I had my Microsoft interview. So, go with something with which you're a bit more comfortable. Assembly language is something、uh, that you will see. In CS61, if you'd like to go that route. All right, so, Internet. What is it? We have hundreds of people taking this class, all of whom use the Internet, some of whom are using the Internet right now. So, what is it? In layman's terms, <laughs> a series of tubes. You've been well educated by The Daily Show.、Uh, so, yes, it's a series of tubes.、Um, Google that and you will, well, we'll Google it now and we'll lose half the attention of the class. That's fine.、Um, so it's a series of tubes, metaphorically, but in real terms, the internet is what? It's some kind of infrastructure that connects. Uh, hundreds, thousands, millions of computers together in the world. So it's some kind of physical infrastructure that, in its simplest form, is computer and computer with some kind of connection in between them. Maybe it's a wire, maybe it's wireless, maybe it's satellite, but it's this mesh, as we kind of saw from that teaser trailer, of interconnections among computers. So the internet is some physical infrastructure. What then is the World Wide Web? It's kind of easy to conflate the two, but what is the web? Well, well, how do you access the web? Obviously, with a web browser. And let's push a little harder. When you use a web browser, you usually type in an address. And even though these days most of us aren't, are, are lazy enough that we don't bother typing this prefix, anytime you go to a web page, hidden there is HTTP, colon slash slash. Though that's changing if you have an iPhone or if you have a mobile device that's hiding these prefixes. But that conjures up something more technical. An HTTP. Is a protocol, hypertext transfer protocol, and it's the language that a web server and a web browser speak when communicating on the internet. So, what does all this mean? Well, the web is just a service, right? Email is a service, instant messaging is a service, a Skype is a service that u s e the internet, which again is this physical infrastructure, to actually make that infrastructure useful. You can send emails using one protocol, you can access web pages using another, and that's because computers on the internet. Clients and servers alike all speak these things called protocols. So, first, some easy jargon. So, client is just like a laptop, it's a desktop, it's something that's not a server. A server, by contrast, is something that lives on the internet. It's almost always listening for connections and requests, and much like a waiter in a, or server in a restaurant, that server responds to requests from clients. All right, so when client re requests something from server and server、uh, responds to client, How they exchange those information,、uh, that information is called a protocol. So, for instance, what's a normal human protocol? Well, if I meet someone for the first time, I might say, Hello, I am David. And what do you do?、Um, I'm a student. <laughs> I'm sorry,、um, uh, you, want you, you extend your hand. Oh, yeah. yeah. But you are indeed a student as well. So, right, so in the, the real world, we have these protocols, maybe silly protocols, whereby if I extend my hand and say, Hi, how are you? Typically, the other person on the other end will extend his or her hand and complete the protocol exchange. And that's all we're talking about when we use the web. So, what does this really mean? Well, if we actually type in 
something like www.google.com into a browser on a laptop, on a client, well, what actually happens? Well, at the very highest level, my laptop contacts Google. Google responds, and I see a big search box. And then I can repeat this transaction and actually provide input this time into the text field. But what my computer is really saying is something pretty simple. My computer, my browser, is essentially sending a very short message saying, get me. Slash, where slash generally denotes the root of a hard drive, or in this case, the root of a web server, the default page. And then I just have to mention in my message to the server what language I want to speak. So this is literally what is sent to a server from my browser. And I, obviously, the human, don't have to know or don't have to do any of that because that's what the browser does. It converts the more human friendly. Google.com into a message like this. What does it mean to send a message? Well, we'll see this too with Mr. TCPIP in the video in, in a while. But you can think of my computer as sort of preparing a little virtual envelope, inside of which it's putting a virtual slip of paper, written on which is a message like this. And then on this virtual envelope, my computer has to put some addresses the to address and the from address. And even if you're not quite sure what they are, you can probably guess to what address am I referring when I talk about the to and the from here? All of our computers have one of these things. So it's an IP address. IP is just Internet Protocol address. And Internet Protocol is, again, just a set of standards that humans agreed on a bunch of years ago. And they decided that according to the IP protocol, everyone, every computer on the Internet is going to have a unique address. And that address is going to be of this form. Uh, W.x.y.z,、uh, where each of these letters is actually a number from 0 to 255, with some exceptions. But in a nutshell, it's something dot something dot something dot something, and each of those numbers is fairly small. And quick, quick check if the, each of these letters is between 0 and 255, how many bits are being used for each of these placeholders? So it's just 8, right? Because 2 to the 8 is 256. So an IP address is 32 bits in total, which means how many possible IP addresses or computers are there on the internet? Right, so roughly 32 billion maximally. You don't need negative numbers, so we can go all the way up to 4,、oh, sorry, all the way up to 4 billion, 2 to the 32. And that might sound like a lot given the number of humans in the world, but frankly, just a few years ago, even the number of IP addresses being used on campus suddenly skyrocketed. What happened over the past few years that has consumed even more of Harvard's IP addresses than traditionally was the case? Yeah, we all have smartphones, right? Every time you walk into this room, if you've configured your phone for either the Harvard University SSID or the CS50 SSID, you walk into a room and bam, your device has requested from Harvard an IP address. So even right now, Harvard itself is, has a, a shortage of sorts of IP addresses, which is solvable technologically. But the world, long story short, is transitioning away from these things,、uh, version 4 of IP. To what's going to be called IPv6. And IPv6, just to paint the picture, is going to use not 32 bits, but 128, which is huge. We're probably not going to run out of IP addresses、uh, in our lifetime if we all adopt this particular standard. So, what goes on then? So, I'm a browser. I create this sort of virtual envelope. I write on a piece of paper that message, get slash in the, using this version, put it inside the envelope. On the front of the envelope, I write the to address, which is the IP address of Google. And then in the top left hand corner of this envelope, I write my address, which is whatever my laptop's IP address is. Well, just to make this more concrete, if you have a Mac, you might have seen this before. You can go up to System Preferences,、uh, you can go to Network, and then you can see exactly what your IP address is at this moment. And as an aside, Harvard owns. No, you can't. You can only see me. Thank you. <laughs> so you can see on a Mac. That this is your IP address if you go ahead and open up your、uh, system preferences and click network. So, Harvard has given me an address of this form, 140.247. As an aside,、uh, most Harvard IP addresses start with that, so you can identify them as belonging to Harvard, but Harvard owns others. And then there's some other stuff called subnet mask and router and DNS. We'll only touch upon some of these things, but for more, take CS143, a networking class. So, each of our computers has an IP address, but I don't know CNN or Google.com's IP address, right? All I, the human user, know is that the website is called Google.com or more properly, www.google.com. So, how, does this, how do I figure this out? How does my laptop figure this out? Well, what's the, the key word here? What's the spoiler? 
So DNS, and we actually saw this acronym a moment ago. So DNS is something also that you might have seen over time, at least somewhere on your computer, but it stands for Domain Name System. And all this refers to is a standard set of servers across the internet whose whole purpose in life is to convert、uh, domain names like Google.com into IP addresses and vice versa. And the advantage here is that I and even my own personal computer don't have to know what Google.com's IP address is because we can just ask one of these servers. What server do we ask? Well, again, when you boot up your computer on campus, Harvard gives you not just an IP address, but it also tells you what DNS servers to use. Or if you're at home, Verizon or Comcast or whoever would tell you the same kind of information. So now I go ahead and I tell my, or my browser, asks the operating system, hey, please ask the local DNS server what the IP is for Google.com. Hopefully, my operating system. Knows the answer because it talks to a DNS server. That DNS server finally responds. And so now I can write it on the to field of this envelope. And I, it's pretty easy for me and my browser to figure out what my own IP address is, just like I, like I did as a human a moment ago. So I can write that on the from address and then I can hand it off to whom. Once I've finished addressing this envelope, filling it with this request, I have to get it to Google, but how does it get there? What's maybe the key word here, even if you're not quite sure how the story goes?、Uh, sorry? ISP, OK, so ISP, Internet Service Providers, typically involved, but they're involved because they have themselves a certain type of server, a certain type of computer, generally called a. Yeah, router. So, a router. So, a router is also maybe a term you've at least heard, right? Cisco and other companies make lots of these things. The name kind of spoils what it does. It routes stuff. Well, what does it route? It routes things like these, these virtual envelopes. And let me start calling it a little something more technical. Instead of virtual envelope, we'll generally call it a packet. So, a packet of information is something like we've been describing metaphorically here as an envelope. So, once your Computer has this, on, this packet ready, it needs to hand it off to someone. And in fact, we kind of glimpsed this a moment ago, at least on a Mac, and Windows and Linux have identical features. If I zoom in here, notice that my computer indeed knows about a router. Its address also starts with 140.247, so that means it belongs to Harvard. And so all my computer has to do via its Ethernet cable or via some Wi Fi connection is actually temporarily. Readdress this envelope, not to Google.com, but to say,、mm, actually send it to 140.247.118.1. And so I still have to mention somewhere on the envelope that the ultimate destination is Google.com and its IP address. But for the first hop, so to speak, for the first router, I'm going to say, let me hand it actually to this guy instead. Now, what happens next? Odds are Harvard's router doesn't know where all possible web servers are on the internet, right? They might know Google, but there's some tiny websites out there that they might not know about in advance. So, what does Harvard's router likely do upon receiving some packet from little old me? Uh, so, DNS actually doesn't need to come into play anymore because at this point in the story, so it's not a bad thought, but we're already talking only in terms of IP addresses. We don't need to work DNS into the picture again. So, what would you do if I hand you a piece of information and say, give this to Matt? What would you do if you don't know who Matt is? Right, maybe you hand this to the person next to you, right? And let them deal with it. And then if he or she doesn't know who Matt is, well, maybe they'll just pass it along and they'll just pass it along. Now, thankfully, on the internet, it's not necessarily the case that every router knows exactly where Matt is or where Google.com is. But because these addresses are number based, that means that very efficiently, these computers can have the equivalent of like、uh, databases or fancy Excel spreadsheets, where in one column is a list of IP addresses that it knows about, and in the other column, Is a direction. A router, as that picture of a meshed network suggests, actually has a connection usually not just to one other router, but maybe to two or three or four. So upon receiving a packet, a router can literally route information left or right or forward or back, up, down, whatever direction the wires are actually going in. And thanks to this routing table inside of its memory, which again, a couple columns, IP in one column and direction in the other, well, the router can decide I don't really know where Matt is, but I know Matt lives on the East Coast. 
So let me send this packet to a router that's a little closer to the East Coast. And then it can make a similar decision and again and again. And so generally, this takes maybe 10 hops, maybe 30 hops maximally. But the internet's designed to be pretty efficient. So if a packet is going around and around more than 30 times to different routers, usually it gets killed, it gets dropped. And then I, the browser, have to figure out how to get it there. More efficiently. So, this is all very abstract, but we can actually make this a bit more concrete. I'm going to go ahead and open up the appliance here. And what I've done in advance is I've actually connected to the Harvard Computer Society server.、Um, a lot of Harvard's network is firewalled in the sense that you can't do certain things. But if I actually connect to this particular system, I can do more than that. So, HCS just refers to that server and my account on it. I'm going to go ahead and do this. I'm going to re log in since I did that too long ago. And I'm going to go ahead and run, I'm going to go ahead and run trace route to, let's say, www.stanford.edu. Right? I know that Stanford's out in Palo Alto, but I'm not quite sure exactly how to get it there. But hopefully, my computer does. If I go and send an email to some friend who's at Stanford, hopefully, my computer can, in fact, trace the route from here to there. So I'm going to go ahead and hit enter. And what we see flying by is a whole bunch of stuff all of a sudden. It looks like 15 lines, 16, 17 lines. So it actually looks like, if we fast forward to the end of this story, that there are 17 hops between me and Stanford University at this moment in time. Or more specifically, between the Harvard Computer Society server, which is also on campus, and Stanford. Why? Well, in step 17, www.lb.stanford.edu is apparently the name of one of Stanford's web servers. LB actually stands for load balancer, so it's some fancier device there. But that server has parenthetically an IP address. It does not start with 140247, because that belongs to Harvard. This apparently belongs to Stanford. And then on the right hand side here, what do you think these numbers mean? Three sets of numbers. What's that? Yeah, the time. So, how long did it take for my data, for my packet, for my email, for my instant message? Whatever it is I'm trying to do at this moment in time on the internet, it took only 89 milliseconds to travel from here in Cambridge, Mass., to Palo Alto, California. Right? And we take this for granted. But if you kind of pause and think about that, like, that's kind of mind blowing. You can only imagine how many hours it takes to physically get a human from Cambridge to Palo Alto. And yet, this is 90 milliseconds.、Right? This is a tenth of a second、um, with which we got this. Data there. So that's kind of cool. But we can see more along the way. Let's actually trace this route as this command implies. Let me scroll back up to the top, and you'll see that the story started here at step one. So this is apparently the IP address of HCS's server. That's step one. And then this one, it doesn't have a name, but it belongs to Harvard just because it starts with the same numbers. And then apparently, Harvard passes the data off to this server, which Because the system administrators decided to give it a name. It has a name now.、Um, I don't really know where this is, but BDRGW, anyone want to guess what this shorthand notation means? Actually, is border gateway. It's like shorthand notation for a router. A gateway is a router. These are synonyms. Border, it's probably literally on the periphery of Harvard's campus somewhere.、Um, and then this has an IP address. As an aside, Harvard also owns a lot of IP addresses that start with 128.103. But this makes sense, right? It only took about two milliseconds to go from Sanders or wherever HCS's server is to this border gateway. And this, you know, pretty reasonable. Two milliseconds because we stayed on campus. Contrast this with going to Stanford. Which is 3,000 miles away, it's reasonable to expect that it's going to take more time than、uh, staying on campus. Well, let's see where my email or my IM or whatever it is I'm trying to do on the internet went to next. Well, in step four, it goes to Knox.org. So, this is actually one of these big ISPs, essentially. Northern Crossroads is what Knox stands for. And that's just one of Harvard's peering points. So, the system administrators here plug their routers via some kind of fancy cables into this other bigger fish on the internet so that our data. Has some place to flow. Apparently,、uh, Northern Crossroads has multiple routers here and here, but where it gets interesting is in step seven. Where is my data apparently at this point in the story? We can only infer, but it looks like Kansas. And if I scroll to the right, look at the times. We jumped from like two milliseconds up to 30 milliseconds. So it stands to reason that there's a few states geographically in between us. This is a bit of an anomaly, right? It feels like 
hmm, if my data took 100 milliseconds to get to this point and then 30 milliseconds to get to the next point, these are from the origin points. So realize the internet is not entirely predictable. It could take some routers, rather, could be slower. They could be congested. And so there could be these、um, bottlenecks someplace on the internet. But whatever that issue was, it went away pretty quickly because from here to Kansas, Looks like it actually only takes closer to 30 milliseconds. Where are we in step eight? Where's my email now? Houston, probably. And by step nine, Los Angeles, probably.、Um, L O S A, I'm guessing. And if we scroll over here, oh dear God, that's quite the detour.、Um, but、um, uh, here, too, not necessarily consistently the case. And here, too, an important takeaway is that if we ran this again or you ran this tonight or tomorrow, these routes could constantly change. One of the key features of the internet, which is particularly inspired by its military origins, is that it's supposed to be dynamic. These routes can and should change over time, especially if the routers or humans running them determine, wow, this, this router in Los Angeles is really slow. Let's route around it at this point. And so this can be reconfigured manually. Or even automatically. So these routes are not hard coded. In fact, there could be any number of ways to get from here to there. So 10 seems to corroborate the idea that we're in LA because LAX、uh, is in the name here. So、um, system administrators have this habit traditionally of using airport codes as the names of their routers. So that's not uncommon to see. I'm not quite sure where this one is, but by step 12, looks like we're somewhere in the campus of Stanford. Then here's another boundary router. Stanford.edu. Here's another border router and Wowza browser, a router. I don't know what this is, but these are just the names they've given to their machines. So, long story short, what do all of these lines represent? These literally represent the path that my email or instant message, or in this case, just simulation, took to get from Cambridge to Palo Alto. Well, let's take a look at one other example that's not even. To another academic institution. That one was using the Internet 2, which is a faster interconnection among a lot of universities. Let's go ahead and do trace route of www.cnn.com. All right, so enter. And this seems to be going this time from Harvard in steps one and two, and then also three and then four. And then apparently there's some kind of cable between Cambridge and Boston. That's pretty reasonable to expect. Then there's some kind of connection between Boston and in step seven, New York. So that's kind of cool that within six milliseconds we can get to Manhattan or thereabouts.、Um, this is probably newer,、uh, no, this is、uh, Washington, D.C.、Um, in step eight and step nine. Step 10, we're in Atlanta. Step 11, we're still in Atlanta. And then these. Routers are apparently not responding to our request at this point for privacy reasons or configuration reasons. So you don't always see exactly what's happening. That doesn't mean there's a dead end. It just means that the program I'm using、uh, or the, the special、uh, protocol, ICMP, that I'm using to do this simulation, it specifically is blocked, not necessarily web traffic or the like. So one last one, right? Because the numbers here are only interesting insofar as that they're pretty damn fast. Two milliseconds to DC, 24 milliseconds to Atlanta. Well, let's do an example where we go not to CNN.com, but like co.jp, which is the Japanese version of their website.、And、let's hit enter here and see what happens. And it's being a little slower. But we see that this is apparently its IP address. OK, so a few servers weren't responding. And unfortunately, we can't see the magic happening here because in steps one, two, three, four, five, let's actually, just for kicks, let's rerun this in case we get better data. Maybe not. But in a moment, we will see. Come on. Actually, let's try the other direction.、Uh, UK. See if this helps. Or not at all. OK. Come on. OK, better. For some reason, it's being pretty slow. All right, so our data is in Boston at the moment. OK, still pretty fast. So this seems to be the network that's just not cooperating. All right, so apparently we're going the long way to London.、Uh, we're going down to Washington, then down to Atlanta, then. Apparently, we're kind of hitting that bottleneck here again. So, this really isn't demonstrating what I wanted to. So, let's try one last time with Japan. Oh, Japan's being better now. So, here we go. Now it's one or two milliseconds to harbor. There's some good data. All right. So, you know, it's kind of sad when you get excited about stuff like this.、Um, so, 
Let's see here. So we've got some Harvard going on at the top, some more northern crossroads, which is in the northeast. northeast. I'm not sure where this or number six is. Seven's just not talking to us. But now eight's getting more interesting. It's apparently in New York City. And this one's cool. This is when you actually do get neat glimpses into the inner workings of the internet. What is in between steps nine and ten? It's like the entirety of the United States, right? SJC is probably San Jose in California. And so this kind of makes sense if the time to get to step nine is 27 milliseconds and the time to get to step 10 is 100 milliseconds, suggests that there's some distance there. And actually, what is between steps 11 and 12? Like literally the Pacific Ocean, right? And so there's some huge、um, sub Pacific cable or cables that are going from the west coast of the US to、um, the east coast of Japan, apparently in Tokyo or thereabouts, between steps 11 and 12. And sure enough, it takes 100 milliseconds to cross the Pacific Ocean. Here, too, kind of think back to things we learned in history class. Like that's kind of fast to cross an ocean. <laughs> Um, so, anyhow, you can very easily get distracted with this. But hopefully, the takeaway here is that what's really happening on the internet is a lot of handing off and off and off of these virtual envelopes, more technically known as packets, inside of which are messages for the recipient. So, what is the recipient going to do? Well, for this, we can actually use a different tool. So, I'm still inside of my appliance here, and I've just loaded up Firefox, which you've probably used at some point this term. But what we've done in the appliance is we've actually pre installed a few helpful tools that don't come with Firefox by default, but they are freely available for your Mac, PC, and the appliance. So if I go to my tools menu, notice that we have a few things here. One is called live HTTP headers, and then soon we'll be playing with things in here web developer like Firebug and these other tools here. But I'm going to go ahead and pull up live HTTP headers. Notice it just gives me this big blank window. And what this thing is going to do is it's going to sniff the traffic. Between my browser and, say, Google.com. And it's going to show me what's inside of these packets that we've been talking about、um, as virtual envelopes. So we can actually see what humans are taking for granted. Now, what's going on here? It looks like Firefox is designed to like, do auto updates or whatnot. So it's already talking, apparently, to Google, of all places. So you can also see with this what your browser is doing when you are not even on the keyboard. But I'll clear that because it's a distraction for this. And I'm just going to go here to. And let me shrink my window a little bit so we can see both at once. I'm going to go to http colon slash slash www.google.com slash enter. And sure enough, on the right hand side, I see all of the secret messages that were inside of this envelope. And I kind of lied to you earlier in that it's not as simple as just saying get slash http 1.0, but it's pretty close. So what we see here at the top of this live http headers window is one, the URL that I just visited. So that's not interesting. But what is inside of the envelope that I just sent? It's everything here that I've highlighted in blue. So the very first message is as promised. It's a slightly newer version of HTTP, but that's a message from browser to server hey, I would like to shake hands with you, so to speak, using this protocol called HTTP. The, what else is in there? Well, apparently the next line, host colon, is a reminder to the server I asked for google.com, www.google.com. Now, just as a quick check, why? Might it be necessary for the browser to explicitly remind the server what its own name is? How is this envelope addressed? What's on the outside of the envelope, rather? The,、uh, so, the router address, or somewhere on there too, the IP address of Google.com. So, because we're using the internet and this、uh, protocol called IP, we're actually routing information from, two from point A to point B using IP addresses. So, this notion of www.google.com and these very human friendly words is something we need to actually typically remind the server of, just in case, as we'll see, there's actually multiple web servers listening, multiple websites listening. At this particular IP address. In the case of Google, not likely, but in the case of Final Project Season and using commercial web hosts, if you actually host a project externally, this will absolutely be the case that multiple domain names share. The same IP address. Now, what's the rest of this? Well, some of this is uninteresting, but this one's a little juicy. Turns out every time you visit a website on the internet, you're telling them a little something about yourself, even if you haven't logged in. You're telling them that in this case, I'm running Linux. I'm telling them that I'm running Firefox. I'm telling them that I'm running version 7.01 of Firefox. And also, 
it seems that I'm also uh, have a cookie. We talked briefly about these in previous weeks, and we'll come back to them more technically this week and next. But I'm essentially showing a hand stamp to the website that says, I've been here before. Because you stamped my hand by storing this thing called a cookie on my hard drive. And by、uh, agreement of HTTP, on the, because we speak this protocol, I'm always going to show you that cookie every time I revisit you because I've been to Google before. So let's just scroll down as to what the server replies with. When I pull up Google.com, the server is going to respond with a very similar message, but with a number, in this case, 200, which means OK. Now, if you've ever seen in a browser the number 404, 401, 500, 403, any of these ring a bell? 404 in particular? What does 404 generally represent? File not found. Like you made a typo or the web server、uh, made a mistake. So, where are those numbers coming from? Why so、uh, technical? They're just inside of the server's response. So, when my browser opens the envelope that was sent from Google to me, inside of there is a message among which is this code that says either 200, which means everything's OK, a y or 404, page not found, and a whole bunch of others. And then there's a whole bunch of other things here which we'll wave our hands at, but、um, these two relate to cookies and some other. Uh, features of the website. So at the end of the day, what we end up seeing is, of course, this. But what's been going on underneath the hood is the entirety of that story. The internet's actually getting data from point A to point B. But because browsers and web servers speak this other protocol, HTTP, and to be clear, that protocol just says if you want data from me, you must send a message that looks like this. And I agree in turn to send you a message that looks like this. But thankfully, Microsoft and Mozilla and Google, they simplify these very、uh, technical details and just show us what we care about, which is typically a page. That looks a little something like this. So that's in a little more detail how the internet works and how the web works. Any questions? All right, so if we peel back this layer now of Google, let me go up here. Let me go to View, Page Source, which is not there. Let me go here and click View Page Source. And what you will see is how Google implemented their website. And in here is a little something called HTML and a lot of something called JavaScript, both of which you will be speaking in just a little bit's time. Let's go ahead and take a five minute break here and we'll come back and start writing some HTML. All right, we are back. So let us learn how to make something like this.、Um, so, How do you actually start putting web pages on the internet? Well, thus far, all of our stories have assumed that there's a browser, a client, and that's easy because almost all of us have that either right now or back in your room. But the server is a little less obvious how you go about doing this. Well, it turns out that all this time, you've been using the CS50 appliance for C programming and to write your code and for other purposes, but it itself is pre configured to be a server. Now, the appliance is only so useful because when you're on campus and you're using wireless, you're Your IP address is actually changing pretty often. So, even though your laptop has a server, a web server on it, even though we haven't used it up until today, it's not really going to be accessible by anyone else on the internet because they don't know your IP address. Your appliance also does not have a human friendly name like Google.com. And also, for security purposes, we've configured the appliance's server to not be accessible on the internet unless you、uh, throw some switch, so to speak, to actually let the outside world have access. But this is the funny thing like a server on the internet does. Does not need to be some mainframe computer that takes up part of a room. It doesn't even need to be a server、uh, in a rack, a rack of servers. Rather, it can literally be our own laptops. People have even hacked things like the Xbox and the PS3 to be web servers because all you need to run a server is just a computer and you need to put the right software on it. And the software is just called web server software. So even though we call physical devices typically servers, that's fine, but it's really the software that's the server, the thing that's Like a waiter in a restaurant actually serving up information. And there's web servers, there's mail servers, there's instant messaging servers, Skype servers. There's a whole bunch of servers or services on the internet, and you just need the right software. And so we already have that. So let me go over to the appliance here. I'm going to go ahead and close Firefox. 
box and just get to the point of having my terminal window open here. So, J Harvard at appliance. Well, when you log into a terminal window in the appliance, you can usually type ls and see what you have in your home directory. You have desktop by default, and you also have source,、uh, I have a source directory from today, but we need a special directory. Almost always, if you have the appliance in this case, or if you have an account on a commercial web server that you can pay $5 a month, $20 a month for,、um, you generally have a username and password. That you can use to connect to the server. Now, even though in the case of the appliance, you don't really need to connect to it, you just need to double click it and it opens, and there you are. It turns out that we can also connect to the appliance as though it's some random server on the internet from our own Mac or PC. So we'll see that in a moment, but first let's do this. I'm going to go ahead into my、uh, home directory where I am by default, and I'm going to type this command mk for make directory, and then I'm going to make a special directory called public underscore html, all lowercase, no spaces, and then I'm going to hit enter. If I really wanted to, or if I wasn't comfortable at the command line, I could also go to my home directory. I could, for instance, go to file, I could go create folder, and do the exact same thing, but by now, Odds are you're、uh, pretty comfortable using the blinking prompt at the terminal window. But there it is public HTML, there's nothing in it. So let's go back to the terminal window and see what we can do with that. I'm going to go into public HTML with CD, as you've done before. I'm going to hit enter, type ls, and indeed nothing's there. So let's do this. I'm going to open up gedit, where even though you usually double click its icon, you can also type its name in all lowercase. And I'm going to create a special file called index.html, all lowercase, no spaces, enter. That's going to go ahead and Prompt gedit to open, and notice in its title bar, it's pointing out that you are inside of your public HTML directory. And that's good, because I want this file to end up in that directory specifically. I'm going to go ahead now and just do the following I'm going to do open bracket, exclamation point, doc type in all caps, HTML in lowercase, and that's it. So, this term, we're using a version of HTML called HTML5. It's sort of the latest and greatest, even though it's not quite a fully adopted standard. This is these technologies, as you might have gathered, are kind of a moving target. Even though C, as we know it, has been the same since 1999, HTML changes by the month, by the year. And so,、uh, we'll focus particularly on the fundamentals over the next few weeks and less on sort of the temporal aspects. But this very first line that I typed in a file called index.html is just a clue to the The browser with which I'm going to open this file that, hey, this is HTML. It's not sufficient, unfortunately, that just the file name ends in .html. You have to be a little more pedantic and at the top of the file say doc type HTML. And then I can proceed to do the following. It turns out that every web page on the internet is composed of what we'll call tags. A tag is something that has an open bracket and a closed bracket. And so this is,、uh, and it's unfortunate that this looks the same. What we just typed is not a tag, it's a special case. But this is a tag open bracket, HTML, closed bracket. And then I'm going to do the opposite, so to speak, here. So every Web page starts with open bracket HTML, close bracket, and then ends with the opposite, where the opposite is the same word with a forward slash inside of the brackets. So you can really think of this quite simply as this means here comes a web page. That's the end of the web page. These are like directives that are just telling the browser so straightforwardly do this, don't do this. Or here's this, here's not this. They're kind of reversing each other's effects. Now, every web page has two main parts. One is called the head of a web page, and I'm going to preemptively create the open part and the closed part, and then the body. And notice, too, just like we did in C, I'm trying to be a little. A nitpicky with my indentation and white space. I'm trying to keep it looking clean, even though, as we saw from Google, that was a mess. The browsers don't care what it looks like, but for humans, it's a good thing. And、um, if we have as much traffic as Google does, where every byte or white space counts, well, then we can resort to that as well. But for now, this is definitely good style. Unfortunately, this is a very uninteresting web page. There's a placeholder for the head of it, there's a placeholder for the body of it, but nothing more. So for now, the only thing we're going to put into the head is going to be a title tag. So, I'm going to go ahead and open title tag and then close title tag. But for the first time, I'm now going to actually put in some content. Hello, comma, world, for instance. So, that's it for title. And then down here, hello, comma, world again. And so, that's it for now. So, I have a title tag in the head. The head is in HTML, but I also have a body tag that's inside of HTML as well. 
but not inside head. So notice the indentation. Just like with curly braces and parentheses in C, similarly, do we have a nice symmetry here, both aesthetically and also logically with our tags. So, what's this going to mean? Well, in a nutshell, when you open up a browser and you go to、uh, a page here, the thing that appears usually in the title bar, that's the head and specifically the title, and everything that appears down below from the、uh, below all the buttons and whatnot, that's the body. So, the body is really 99%. Of a web page. So now let me go back to this file. I'm going to go ahead and make sure I saved it with File, Save, or Control S. And that's it. So this is all the web page is. Indeed, an uninteresting web page, but it's just a text file. Just like C programs are text files, so is a web page a text file. But the thing with a web, web page is you don't compile it. This is literally what's going to get sent to the browser.、Uh, HTML is what's called an interpreted language, which means you don't convert it to zeros and ones, rather, you just send it to a machine. And the machine then reads it top to bottom, left to right. So the takeaway here immediately is that if you're at all concerned for your intellectual property, it doesn't matter. Like, it's out there. When you write web pages, anyone on the internet can see your HTML. But the reality is, HTML is not an interesting language. It's kind of fun to play with it first, and we're going to use it quite a bit to make more interesting things. But it's just static markup. It's entirely aesthetic. It's not a programming language because there's no notion of functions or loops or conditions. All there is is do this, don't do this. And so we'll see a few more examples of that. So now let's go ahead and open this. So I'm going to go ahead and open up Firefox. And as promised, the appliance itself is a server, which means it's listening for connections from browsers and from other things on the internet. So I'm going to go up to the address bar and I'm going to open my own web page. I'm going to go to http colon slash slash localhost. So I'm specifically typing localhost because that's the nickname. That's like the, the local google.com name for my own appliance. Slash, and then this is the convention. Because we're currently using a JHarvard account, if I literally type tilde JHarvard, I'm going to have a URL right now that looks like this. So, definitely not good for the branding of my website. No one's going to remember this, and the tilde is hard to find even on some keyboards. But this is the convention. Typically, when you, little old you, has an account on a server, and that server is a web server, you can access your pages at a URL that looks like this. As an aside,、um, you all probably have FAS accounts back from problem set、uh, zero, even though we haven't used them. But that means you actually have access to www.people.fas.harvard.edu slash tilde. Username, where username is your own FAS username. So that's where Frogman and my UC campaign used to live, at crazy long URLs like that. I mean, just imagine trying to write that on a poster、uh, back in the day. No one, no one visited my website, is the point of this story.、Um, so <laughs> let's hit enter and see what my web page looks like. Enter. Damn it. So there's a problem. And there's that number. I see it in the title and in the tab 403 forbidden. So this has something to do with permissions. And this is actually a good thing. It's a mistake on my part, but it's a good thing in that clearly by default, when I create files on the internet, they're not accessible to the whole world until I tell the world, now you may look at these files. So I have to actually run a new command. I have to do a couple of things. First, let me go back to my home directory by typing cd. And then I'm going to go ahead and do ls l. And this gives me The long listing. And you've done this before for a problem set. Now, notice for public HTML, I have, and desktop, notice that they just say this drwx hyphen, 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 hyphen. What does all of that actually mean? Well, let me go ahead and just open up real fast a text editor just so I have someplace to type. And let me just repeat that. So the public HTML directory currently looks like this hyphen, hyphen, hyphen. Hyphen, hyphen, hyphen. These are its so called permissions. Now, what does this mean? There is always the same number of characters here. D just means directory, and it's, public HTML is a directory. We made it ourselves. And just take a guess what does R stand for? Read, W, write, X. Executable. So, what do these mean in the context of a directory? Well, right here, I'm going to say this is me. And this is all over here. And I'm just going to put a question mark for now as to these middle three. And let me separate them just a little bit to make this a little more clear as to what represents what. If I just add some white space here, these 
three triples of hyphens or letters represent permissions for three different people. Me is the one on the left. So, me, I have read, write, and executability permission for this directory. What does that mean? Read means you can see the contents, write means you can change the contents. Executable means you can double click the folder or CD into it. You can actually get into it. It doesn't mean execute like run, it means you can actually open it and go inside in the first place.、Um, as an aside, the middle three refer to what's called a group. If you've ever poked around on your appliance, you might know that. John Harvard is always associated with students somehow. Well, that's the group that you're in, so to speak. But for now, we'll just pretty much ignore that one because the interesting one is on the right hand side. Hyphen, hyphen, hyphen means all. The rest of the internet has no permissions whatsoever. There's no R, there's no W, there's no X, which means everybody else on the internet is not going to be able to touch this directory at all. But this is a problem because if I want this directory to be on the internet, I need to give the world a few permissions. And the most important one is executability. Minimally, if I have Web files in here. My HTML is in this directory. Surely the world has to be able to get into this directory somehow. So I can use a new command for that called chmod for change mode. And I can simply type change mode, chmod,、uh, A for all plus X, so all plus executability. And then I just mention the name of the directory. Enter. And now, if I do ls l again, notice what's changed. Public HTML is still read, write, execute for me. But also execute for everyone else, as well as my group. But again, I'm going to wave my hand at the group detail. The last one is what's really important. So let's now reload. Hopefully, I've fixed all my problems. I'm going to click reload. Still forbidden. So, what, who might be the culprit now? Yeah, what about index.html? Let's go in there. So, cd public HTML. Let me type ls l. And this looks OK. It looks like my file was created with readability privileges for everyone. All right, because that's how I、um, configured it in advance. But if I go here, let me do one other command. I hit cd to go back to my home directory, ls al. There's a whole bunch of stuff. It turns out inside of your home directories, there's all of these dot files, files that literally begin with a period. And by convention in Linux, anything that starts with a dot, Mac OS 2 is hidden. You don't see it when you type ls or double click a folder. But this is all like preferences and cache files and temporary stuff that programs just Put there so you don't really see it. But what I care about is this one. At the very top, notice that there's a folder called dot. What does dot represent? Your current directory. So dot means this directory. So I'm in my home directory. So this very top line means I own my home directory, J Harvard. That makes sense. I'm in the students group. We know that. But notice, I have the ability to execute this directory, but it turns out I need to let the rest of the world into my home directory too. I don't want them to have readability. I don't want the R, because I don't want them to see what files I have in my account, but I at least want them to be able to open it, so to speak, so as to visit it on the web. So to fix this, I'm going to do chmod, whoops, A plus X, and I can solve this in a couple of ways. I can say dot, because I'm in the directory I care about. I can say tilde, because that represents my home directory too. Enter. That hopefully fixed that problem. Now let's go back to my browser and reload. Ah, my first web page on the internet. Well, not really the internet, on my computer. So that's progress. So notice, I'm in a browser. I'm actually telling the browser to talk to localhost as though it's a server, even though localhost is a special name that refers to my own computer, my own appliance. Tilde J Harvard means go into the J Harvard guy's account and specifically go into his public HTML. So the web server knows that Tilde J Harvard actually means John Harvard's public HTML directory. And this, frankly, is a little confusing. You might recall from P sets and whatnot that you very often type things like、uh, CD. Uh, plus, til, or you might do something like、uh, ls tilde cs50 just to kind of poke around cs50's account. Tilde cs50, when you're at a terminal, refers to cs50's home directory. Unfortunately, when you're in a browser, tilde j harvard or tilde cs50 actually refers to those users' public HTML directories. So you just have to remember that it's different at the black and white window as it is in the browser. All right, so this is a very underwhelming web page. I feel like I didn't really need to go to Harvard for this. So let's kind of do better than this.、Um, so, what can we do? Well, first, let's notice this. Let me go over to my own computer. So now I'm on my Mac. I'm using Chrome, and I have a brand new browser open here. And I've been visiting Rob's eyes again. Okay.、Um, <laughs> So let me go to this address now http colon slash slash localhost slash tilde j harvard and then enter. So notice this does not work. 
Because now when I'm on my Mac or when I'm on my PC, if I go to localhost, what's it obviously referring to now? My own computer, the local host. But it turns out, and we've not needed to know this before, it turns out that your CS50 appliance has its own special IP address, a number of that form, w.x.y.z. You can always visit 192.168.56.50. And this is documented and will be on the next problem set, so don't worry about memorizing it. But notice that this might actually look a little creepily like the one at home, right? Not at Harvard, but back home, if you have your own personal router and you've ever seen your IP address. Well, it turns out that any IP that starts with 192.168 is a private IP address. The world、uh, had the foresight to realize sometimes we don't want IPs to be publicly accessible on the real internet, so this is a private one that we adopted for our own purposes. So if I hit enter now, notice that now on my Mac, I can visit the appliance as though it's a random server on the internet with an IP address. And so now I'm kind of simulating using the internet. And what you'll find for final projects and P sets, you all actually have counts already on cloud.cs50.net, which is a server that's actually on the internet. You've probably seen this page before. Well, you can actually put your own accounts on here so that eventually you'll be able to have cloud.cs50.net slash tilde mailin, or if that's your username. Or more interestingly, for final projects, for just a few dollars if you want, you can buy your own domain name and actually change a crazy looking U address like that to actually be something simple like I saw you Harvard.com. In fact, when Tej made that website, she had it living on cloud.cs50.net in her own tilde so and so account, but we hid all of that details for her automatically. Automatically, so that she actually had a sexier URL that real people could actually remember. So, this tilde stuff is really just useful for development purposes. So, let's go back into the appliance and let's actually start making this web page a little more interesting. So, what are all of these things in turquoise? So, each of these tags. It has an open tag and a closed tag, and they again tell the browser what to do. Here's the title, here's the body. Well, suppose we want to make things a little more interesting, and I actually want to make something bold. So I can say something arbitrarily like hello in bold as follows open bracket B, and then close bracket B over here. So now again, notice the symmetry. B denotes bold. If I save this and then I go back to my browser, whether on my Mac or on the appliance, and reload, it's not quite a huge change, but now you can see the difference there a little bit. So let's actually go back into here and see if we can't make this a little uglier still. So let me go into body. And I want to change the background color. Like, this is a pretty lame web page, white background, black text. Let's try to do something more interesting. Well, it turns out that HTML tags can have attributes. Attributes modify their behavior, and they look like this name equals quote unquote value, where name is the name of an attribute and value is how you want to control the behavior of the tag. So, this is not a real attribute and value pair. I need to do something legitimate like BG color for background color. And let's do something crazy like pink, quote unquote. Let me go back to my browser after saving, reload, and now it's starting to get hideous, right? So now, and let me just increase the font size artificially with my browser just by zooming in. I didn't fundamentally change the web page yet. Let's now see if we can make our text a little different. So making text a little different gets a little more complicated these days, but that's okay. I'm going to go ahead and do the following.、Um, I want to make this whole sentence or this whole phrase a different color. And so I can't really do this right now because I don't want to do this on the body tag just yet. So I'm actually going to do this. I'm going to start making more to this page than just one line of text. So I want to create what we'll call a division. And div division just makes sort of an invisible rectangle, sort of like you might have if you're a newspaper editor just trying to lay out articles on a, on a physical page. Div just says, Create a virtual rectangle here and apply a bunch of stylization all to this tag,、uh, all to this division at once. So I want to style this division of the page. Style equals quote unquote. So notice this is an attribute that's going to modify the behavior of the division of the page. And I'm not going to do anything just yet. No style for this element. I just want to do a little sanity check back in the browser to make sure that this division didn't change anything in a bad way. So I'm going to reload. And in fact, nothing bad has happened. Nothing visually has happened. But let's do this. Let me right click or control click on the web page, go to view page source, and you can do this on any website on the internet. There is, in fact, my same page. But realize, and don't get confused, I'm in a browser now. I cannot start typing in Firefox to change the web page. I need to change it on the server, where in this case the server is the appliance itself. This is just read only. So let's now change the style here. Let's go into、uh, gedit again. 
and let me go and say, you know what, I want the color of this text to be, let's say, red. So notice the difference here. Anytime you're inside of quote marks, specifically inside of style attributes, quote marks, you actually say what's called a property, colon, and then something else. And if this feels like this is all of a sudden becoming a lot to take in, honestly, like HTML is kind of really simple at the end of the day. This is, we've almost seen already all of the fundamental puzzle pieces, much like in Scratch. We spent like 20 minutes on Scratch, and then you just kind of poke around and see what other puzzle pieces there are. Same idea is going to apply here.、Um, we'll show you a number of tags this week and in section, but you'll then realize that Google is your friend and you can find some other feature just by poking around or reading some manual. So I know from having read the manual that color colon In red is going to do exactly that. So let me go back to my browser after saving. I'm going to reload. All right, so now it's getting a little hideous. So let's do another line of text. I'm going to go in here and say, Goodbye, world! Exclamation point. Now I'm going to go back to my browser and save. And hmm, that's not really what I intended here. So we've got our first little hiccup. So why is this second line appearing on the same line as the very first thing I typed, do you think? It's the same paragraph. It's in the same division. Or more specifically, HTML is really kind of a dumb language by design. Like, if it will only make a browser do something if it tells the browser to do that explicitly. You can hit enter all day long, as I'll do here enter, 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 put, put a huge amount of space, right? Just kind of trying to make the browser notice my white space, but it doesn't have any effect. But if I view the source in Firefox, it's there. It's just being ignored. So I have to actually go back and be a little more explicit. If I actually want a line break, so to speak, I actually have to say something like br, which is the tag in HTML for line break. So here, too, you can see how it, HTML is very like, pedantic. It says, make this bold, stop making this bold. Put line break here, then the next line of text. But here, too, a little bit of、um, asymmetry. Notice that I don't have to do this. It's actually not wrong. You are allowed to do this, but this is just kind of stupid, right? It's a line break. It's either there or it's not. You can't sort of start breaking the line and putting stuff on the next line and then stop midway through, right? You either move the cursor down or you don't. So in this case, it's kind of an anomaly. This is an empty element, so to speak, that doesn't have or doesn't need a close tag. Now, as an aside, if you do read up on HTML online and specifically a variant of HTML called XHTML, you'll see all sorts of conventions. And for HTML5, they simplified it. So, what we just did here is right. Not all tags need to be closed. But let's save this. Let's go back to the browser here. Reload. OK, a y so now it's getting a little more interesting visually, but this is not the web page I know. I kind of like going to websites because they're not dead ends. I can click on things. Well, let's actually go here and let's say goodbye, world. Well, this is getting uninteresting. Let's get rid of this. Actually, let me save this. And we'll just put it down below so I don't delete all of our hard work. I'm going to make another division. And just as a test, test one, two, three, I just want to see where this is going to end up. But what's nice about a division is it indeed makes a rectangle invisibly. So this next division or paragraph is lower on the page. So let's go over here and tweak this a little bit.、Um, let's say here are some of my favorite websites. So, I can do this, and then I can say cs50.net and facebook.com save. But of course, you should know where this is going. This just looks atrocious, right? They're not clickable, first of all, and they're also not on this next line. So, let's fix this in a couple of ways. Well, it turns out that HTML supports a bunch of features. Here's one that's somewhat arbitrary there's something called an unordered list, UL. Let me indent this and close the unordered list. And it's unordered in that it's not going to have numbers associated with it. And then in front of each of these list items, I'm going to use the li tag. So we'll see in just a moment. Open li, close li, save, reload in my browser. OK, a y so it's still hideous, frankly.、Um, but you've seen the extent of my web capability. So this isn't all that far off. So here we have now an unordered list, but still, this is not hyperlinked, right? This is not going anywhere. So let's make a link. Well, this too is actually pretty easy. You can't just say cs50.net. You have to actually tell the browser, create a link to cs50.net. So the tag for that is the anchor tag, A. href for hyper reference, which just means URL, quote unquote, http colon slash slash, actually we use s, so colon slash slash, www.cs50.net. And then over here, I have to close the anchor tag 
So even though I have an attribute on this anchor tag, the name of the anchor tag is just A. So when you close a tag, even if it has attributes, you don't copy and paste the attributes again. You just succinctly use the name of the tag. So let's do a quick save and see if I'm on the right track. Reload. Ah, so it's blue and kind of ugly and old school. But if I click this now, it actually does go to the course's website. Let me go back over here. Now we can do facebook.com as well. So let's zoom in here. So we can go A, href equals HTTP, dot, dot, facebook.com, slash. And then over here, we can close this tag. Or, you know, we can even, right? Well, no, watch this, myspace.com. So now that still works. So notice this dichotomy. And herein lies a wonderful opportunity for social engineering attacks. So all of us have probably gotten emails from like PayPal saying, please change your password, or even from Harvard.edu webmaster or whatever, saying, please fill out this form and tell us、uh, so we can reset your password. As of now, realize it is pretty trivial to make a web page or even make an HTML based email that says one thing and goes somewhere else. Case in point, This is what myspace.com apparently is these days. So if we go back here, <laughs> notice the dichotomy. So it says, obviously, facebook.com, but if I hover over this link, it's going to be a little small, but notice there are some telling signs this is actually going to take me to myspace.com. And that's because the destination is decoupled from the actual label. So if you've ever been the recipient of some phishing attack where clicking a link actually takes you somewhere illegitimate, that's actually. Uh, how we can do this. So, if we're making this ugly, we might as well go all the way. So, let's、um, actually, no, no offense. <laughs> okay. So, we have some eyes on the desktop here, but here's the problem. So, Rob's eyes are currently on my own Mac's desktop, but the appliance, of course,、uh, rather, the, my website is inside of the appliance. So, how do I get Rob's eyes into the appliance? Well, there's a couple ways. And frankly, the easiest approach is probably just to open Firefox in the appliance and download the eyes in the right location. But you're not always going to think of that. And maybe on your own personal laptop, you've got photos and whatnot in your hard drive, and you want to upload those, so to speak, into the appliance. You can actually upload Upload files into the appliance very easily.、Um, I only have a Mac running here at the moment, but let me just demo the Mac and I'll point you toward the PC instructions. On a Mac, you can go to the Go menu. You can then say connect to server. And even though it's the CS50 appliance, as of today, turns out it's been a server all this time. Oops, I shouldn't skip over the most important detail. So notice in the window, I just have to type this the IP address of the appliance, and then this thing. This is a different protocol. It's not HTTP, it's something called Samba, which is Windows file sharing. And so SMB colon slash slash, if I hit enter here, notice in a moment it's doing connecting dot 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 dot, and voila, now I have my JHarvard home directory mounted on my Mac. And you can do the exact same thing in Windows、um, so that you have a window on your own computer connecting your computer with this, and you don't have to use something like Dropbox or other tricks.、Um, for the PC instructions, just go to manual.cs50.net and go to the appliances page for how to transfer files back and forth. But the point here is I can now open my index.html file. I can now drag Rob's eyes into this folder. I can now go back, whoops, back to the appliance itself. And let's just do a quick check. I'm going to go into public HTML, ls l. Ah,、oh, there's going to be a problem. Rob's eyes are not accessible on the internet yet, or on the appliance in this case here. So let's actually see what happens when this is the case. Let me go, yeah, we're, we're, not going to keep, we're not going to put in、uh, points for effort here. Might as well just plop it at the bottom. So let's do this image for image tag,、uh, source for the source of the image. And then I could put a URL, but if I already have the file locally, I can just say eyes.png. And now I can go over here. I can go back to my browser and reload. And unfortunately, we now see nothing. And yet, if I go up here to view page source, Rob's eyes are definitely there, at least in terms of HTML. So, how did we fix this before? Well, before we did chmod. A plus, whoops, we did chmod A plus X, which was executability. But an image is not something that's executable. It's not a directory and it's not a program. So, what do you probably want to do to, in order to see an image? Yeah, so you can kind of guess. Read, so chmod A plus R for read, eyes.png, ls. And now this too is world readable, so to speak. The R is a good thing. Let's go back to the browser, reload, and oh my gosh, that's. <laughs> 
Well, that's even worse than usual, but you really see the, the glint in his eye now. And that's just because I zoomed in on this page a moment ago in my browser. But we can also make this clickable. And remember, we did this really fast last time. Just because a link is normally text doesn't mean it has to be. So we can do a href. And I apologize to Rob that it's getting creepy that I know the URL of his Facebook profile now. <laughs> <laughs> Academic purposes. Um, so let's save that. And now notice we've sandwiched now an image tag inside of the open A tag and the close A tag. The href is going to go to, again, Rob Bowden's web page. If I now reload this, it doesn't look any different, but if I hover over his eye, you see that the cursor appears. If I now click on that glint in his eye, I either go to Facebook where if I log in, I can now befriend Rob Bowden. So why don't we leave it on that note and we'll see you again on Wednesday.